Hello, everybody, and welcome to Biking to Work, a webinar with London Cycling. My name is Kelsey Nichols, and I'm the Signal Boost Coordinator with Reforest London, and today I'm pleased to join you as the moderator of this event today. Um, so if you're not familiar with us, Reforest London is a London-based charitable nonprofit that partners with the community to enhance the environmental and human health of the forest city through the benefits of trees. And we're primarily known for uh, public tree planting events and tree giveaways and working with the community. Um, but in addition, we're also the founders of the new Westminster Pond Center for Environment and Sustainability. So launched in October 2019, it will be a new community hub with services and programming that promote environmental excellence, sustainability, health, and well-being across our region. So this uh, event today is brought to you by um, the Signal Boost Initiative, which is a program of the Westminster Pond Center. Um, this program allows us to dramatically increase the number of public and volunteer educational opportunities that are available in London. Um, so while the events will eventually take place at the Westminster Pond Center, uh, in the meantime, we're still doing um, online webinars until the COVID shutdown totally ends. Um, and so this event is made possible with support of the Ontario Trillium Foundation. So this event is also a part of the new program called My Wild Green Home. And uh, so Leah will join to explain that. Um, great, thank you, Kelsey. Um, so hi, everyone, I'm Leah and I'm with London Environmental Network. We are a nonprofit organization in London that aims to build participation collaboration and capacity in the community to co-create positive environmental change. So Reforest London and London CycleLink are members of London Environmental Network and we work to uplift their messaging. Um, London Environmental Network is also a co-organizer of the Go Wild, Grow Wild Green Expo, which was um, postponed for this year. So we are now transitioning um, to bring it to you virtually through My Wild Green Home. So this webinar is part of that My Wild Green Home experience to help you go, grow, and get green safely from home. And you can learn more at gowildgrowwild.ca and it'll actually redirect you to the My Wild Green Home website where you can browse um, different upcoming events like this one, as well as articles and um, more environmental organizations in the community that are working to make change. And that's it. Thank you, Kelsey. Thank you for that, Leah. Um, all right, before we get going, I just wanted to mention a couple of other upcoming events coming up. So um, today's event will be just, I'm super excited about this one. I think as the economy starts to open up more and more and more uh, businesses are are going to be back at the office. It's a great time to be planning to bike to work. Um, so if you enjoy this event, you'll also maybe want to check out um, a full day, actually in-person permaculture workshop that's coming up. Uh, we're also doing a workshop about growing uh, wild foods in your yard and then eating them with growing chefs. Uh, and then there will also be a fruit and nut tree care workshop, intro to seed collecting, um, and if you're interested in any of these other events, and also I should say there are new events added all the time, so visit reforestlondon.ca for more details. Um, there's also a couple of programs on that website, such as um, some volunteer opportunities coming up, with our aftercare, and um, there's lots of kids' activities in our Seeds to Forest Home School edition. Uh, and if you ever have any questions, just reach out to me at signalboost at reforestlondon.ca. Okay, so now I'm going to introduce the speakers. So today we are joined by Daniel Hall. He's the executive director of the London Cycling and is passionate about helping more Londoners discover the joys of cycling. With a background in engineering and urban planning, he uses the bicycle not only as a great way to get around, but a solution to many of our urban challenges, such as constrained budgets, increasing emissions, obesity, and mobility inequity. We're also joined by Taylor Doyle, uh, who is the events coordinator with London Cycling, and she has experienced cycling in both both Londons, so London, Ontario, and UK. As a visual artist, Taylor's interests lie in cycling culture and the way cycling shapes our experiences. She believes that the world is best experienced from atop a bicycle. Bikes for all. All right, well, that's it for me, and um, go ahead. Thanks so much, Kelsey. 
Um, before we dive into our Biking to Work presentation, uh, we wanted to just tell you a little bit about London Cycling. Um, so we're a nonprofit, member-supported organization that helps more Londoners ride more often. We do that in a variety of ways. Uh, the first thing that we do is advocacy. And so we work uh, with city councillors and city staff to build safer infrastructure for cycling. Uh, we build community. So we host events. Um, we create support among the cycling community so that more people can ride. And we educate. So we educate through bike maintenance and also through uh, webinars like this. Um, one of our biggest projects is the Squeaky Wheel Bike Co-op. That is a do-it-yourself bike shop in Old East Village. Uh, if you ever need your bike fixed and want to learn how to do it yourself, bring it in. Uh, we have all the tools and know how to help you fix your bike. Um, that said, we also work with a lot of organizations uh, like Reforest London and like London Environmental Network. And one of the projects we want to tell you about is the Environmental Action Incubator. So this is a picture of a bike pulling a trailer and we, uh, we like to walk the talk and get to all of our events by bike. And so we have received a grant from London Environmental Network to purchase an electric bike so that we can go further and faster um, to our events. And it's also a way that we can support the environmental sector by offering the bike and trailer to other organizations. Uh, we're working with Urban Roots right now so they can deliver veggies by bike um, to their various markets. Today's workshop, uh, we're gonna cover briefly the benefits of cycling. We're gonna share our own experiences of cycling to work or cycling for errands with you. We're gonna address some common myths and answer some frequently asked questions. Um, we'll describe a video about the buying a used bike that we've pushed out recently, and then we'll share some tips and tricks um, of actual riding and what, what to do, and then a demo of how to plan your route so that you're choosing the safest or the, the most convenient routes for you. And we'll finish with some questions and answers. So certainly if you have a question at any time, please ask it in the question, uh, question box and we will get to it at the end. So without further ado, Taylor is going to start us off with the benefits of cycling. Cool. Thank you, Tan. Um, so cycling is super important to me. And the more people I can get to feel comfortable on a bike or to try riding in the first place, uh, the better. Uh, so we are going to start with the benefits of cycling. And chances are, if you are here listening today, you probably already have a small list of your own reasons for wanting to try cycling, uh, cycling to work specifically. Um, or maybe you have already and uh, you need more reasons to do it more often. Um, but just briefly to remind you all of the great reasons there are to commute by bike. Uh, the first thing, of course, uh, is physical exercise. And apparently this is the number one reason that people want to try cycling to work, uh, which is understandable. So, of course, muscular and cardiovascular health. You will notice feeling stronger and more fit the more that you cycle. Um, only 16% of Canadian adults are getting the rec recommended amount of physical activity every day, uh, which is pretty staggering, uh, but it's very easy to change for yourself. Cycling to work is a great way to naturally fit it into your day already. Um, you already have to get to work, um, and your body will thank you. The second benefit that we have is mental health. Um, this is a big one. If you have time and space to decompress and organize your thoughts, you're going to be more clear and more calm um, and focused. Regular physical activity can be a powerful medicine for many common mental health challenges, including things like depression and anxiety. It also relieves stress and improves your memory. Um, it helps you sleep better and boosts your mood overall, which we could all use. Uh, of course, a huge one also is environmental health. Uh, commuting by bike is a great way to reduce your carbon footprint. 44% of all emissions come from transport in London, and 64% of all trips in London are less than five kilometers, which can be done in 15 minutes by bike, 15 minutes or less. Uh, financial health, of course, is a big one for a lot of people. I know it was huge for me when I first started cycling and the reasons I started cycling. Um, the money you are saving on a vehicle uh, for gas and parking even uh, begins to add up. The average Canadian household with children spends $18,209 a year or $50 a day on transportation. Uh, so that's, that's a big deal. Uh, so those are the four big ones. Uh, some additional benefits. 
that you can um, expect that are related to the big ones are, of course, productivity. You arrive at work feeling uh, productive and ready to take on new challenges. Uh, your neighborhood connection, so you might feel a, a renewed connection to your neighborhood and local spaces and spaces that you might not be traversing regularly otherwise. Of course, you get time in nature, uh, depending on your commute, uh, refreshing time in nature that uh, uh, green spaces and things that you might not have incorporated into your day more often. It's also proven to positively affect mood and decrease stress. You may knowingly or unknowingly be a positive influence to the people around you. Um, whether you know it or not, people are impressed. And it is impressive that you cycle to work. Uh, so you might influence others, um, which is generally just positive to try it themselves. Um, it's also great for children if you have kids. Um, whether you're commuting with them or not, this sets a great example and teaches them the importance of physical activity and that there are alternatives to motor transport. In my opinion, there's no better feeling than using a body-powered machine to get you places. Uh, the confidence and independence that you get from that is just amazing. Uh, so those are the benefits. Those are all the reasons that I think you should cycle to work and we think you should cycle to work. Um, next, we're going to talk about quickly our own experiences and stories from cycling to work. So Dan, when did you first start cycling to work? Thanks, Taylor. Um, so it started right after university, um, about 2008, and uh, I was biking to the university or back, to, back and forth from campus already, but it wasn't a, a sort of everyday thing, it was just sometimes. But when I got my sort of first quote unquote real job, I was in Hyde Park in London and I was living downtown, and I think it was uh, maybe a 25 minute bike ride or something like that. And I remember I had not a very good bike, it was an old road bike. Um, I remember the wheel wobbled and I remember just I didn't know which route I just took the most direct route um, to get there fastest and I was very fortunate that I had a shower there so that was one of my the perks of, of doing it um, but yeah I remember learning along the way and I was originally motivated by the environment and finances um, I just graduated university I didn't have any savings and I wanted to, to keep costs low and I knew that it was good for the environment. So those were my initial motivations for why I wanted to do it. But what kept me going, because um, there's days when, you know, a car passes you too closely and you feel a little nervous, or um, maybe it wasn't such good weather, or you feel sluggish and you just don't want to do it. But what kept me motivated was um, I would arrive at work feeling productive, and that went a long way. Um, and on the way home, I would be able to de-stress it was sort of a stressful first job, and I remember just needing that time on my bike to, to sort of decompress. Um, so fast forward a few years, uh, probably been biking for, for 12 years now to work and back, and I've changed how I've done things. I used to kind of bike fast and um, arrive, and then I had a shower and change clothes and, and get to my desk. And now my, my routine is to wear whatever I'm gonna wear, ride slow, my bike's a lot slower and more upright, so I, I feel comfortable. Um, it's just the sort of, for me, that was the evolution. Not everyone has done that, um, but that, that seems to work for me. And so I don't often change when I arrive, I just arrive and get right to work. Um, and that's my experience. And I'll share one of my favorite things about, about cycling around London is the spontaneous encounters with people. Uh, so whether it's someone who's walking on the sidewalk or someone in front of their house, um, the number of times that that just sort of brightens my commute because I run into someone I know um, are, are countless. So that's one little perk. Um, Taylor, I want you to tell us about uh, both London's and, and share your story of, of cycling. Right. Um, so yeah, I, I moved to uh, London, England uh, three years ago now. Um, and when I, just before I had moved, I was just getting into cycling uh, in London, Ontario. So I'm actually not that, I'm quite new uh, to cycling actually in the grand scheme of things. Um, but yeah, I moved to London, England uh, to do a two year master's degree. Um, and I still live and work there now most of the time. Um, and I always cycle to work and I, yeah, I wouldn't have any other way. Uh, when I first moved, I knew that I was not going to be able to afford living anywhere close to central London uh, if it was going to work. Uh, so and I still live in that in that same place. I live in quite south London, England. Um, 
and it's about a 15 kilometer commute uh, in each direction. And uh, as I said, I wouldn't have it any other way now. Uh, when I first got there, of course, I was learning how to ride on the left side of the road, uh, which was a little daunting. Um, it was great if I had a buddy, uh, when I had a buddy to sort of cycle with and get comfortable. And um, it, it didn't take too long to get comfortable on the road. Um, I was also fortunate, uh, like Dan, to have a shower and sort of changing facilities waiting for me on the other side. Um, but yeah, uh, so yeah, I think that for me, the benefits were also feeling good when I got there. I always say and still say it's better than a cup of coffee. Um, I still have a cup of coffee, uh, but it just tastes better. Um, and that feeling of freedom and sort of mobility, I now, um, after sort of like a few years of figuring out how to carry things, I know that I want certain racks on my bike and I have certain bags and I just started out with a backpack. Um, so you really don't need anything to get started, but once you do start, you can start to refine sort of like what you, what you need and what you want to carry. Um, and every time I did feel sorry for myself and sort of, I was like, I want to take a break. I'm tired. Um, I'm going to take the underground. I'm going to take the subway. And literally every time, as soon as I would step into that subway during, during rush hour, during prime time, I would be, if I could even get on, on that specific train if I had to wait for the next one because it was too crammed I would sweat like just as much um, if not more on the tube uh, than on my bike because it was stressful and it was hot even in the winter it's hot down there and I would just like tell myself just like pray like Taylor like please remember how unpleasant this is and how much you love feeling the wind through your hair instead of being crammed on this on this uh, tube with a bunch of people. Um, so yeah, it would probably happen every like two months that I'd be like, oh no, I'll try try transport again. And then I would be like, no. And yeah, now that I've made it a habit, it's quite a huge part of my life. So yeah, I think next we're going to talk about myths and perceived barriers. Yes, um, so just we, uh, we've talked about the benefits of cycling. And we think that for most people, there's, you know, that those are familiar to them, but there's whatever reason where a lot of us aren't riding. So we want to hear from you. We have a poll question about what keeps you from riding. And we're going to answer some common ones, the common myths and, and barriers or address them. So if we're going to think, go ahead and launch a poll here. Okay, thanks for sharing. There we go. Um, so 40% the most was weather and then distance and unsafe streets and theft were all in there as well. So hopefully what we have to say um, to you today is, uh, hopefully we'll be able to address some of that, uh, those myths and, and some of the barriers that uh, are causing you not to want to ride to work. Um, so the first myth that we hear a lot is that you have to be a pro on a racing bike to bike to work. So you have to wear spandex and you have to be in a, on a fast bike and um, quite frankly that's just not true. Cycling is for all ages and abilities um, whether you're there's a, an urban planning term that says eight years old to 80 years old and that's kind of what we want to shoot for with, with cycling to get places. Um, so you don't have to, don't, don't think, you're going to see some of those people out there, that's okay. Um, they like to ride too, but cycling can be for um, the small child heading to school or for the elderly person um, going to meet a friend. And we'd like to encourage you to start small. So instead of thinking about, oh, biking to work, that's, a, that's an onerous journey, um, pick something really small, like going to a friend's house or going to the nearby store to pick up a few things as your first you know, attempt at biking to, for something practical. Um, and that will build confidence so that you then can um, continue to expand that, that window or that, the places that you want to cycle. Okay, so uh, myth number two that we are uh, busting today is that the streets are dangerous. Um, of course, there is some truth to this. Um, the streets can be dangerous. Um, but as you gain confidence and experience, you can traverse much, much of this city very safely, especially with planning and especially with sort of getting used to where you're going. Uh, the City of London is making things better every year. 
Uh, and in the meantime, there's still lots of ways to avoid sections that feel dangerous and that make you feel unsafe uh, between bike paths, uh, bike lanes, and uh, back roads, things that sort of like uh, avoid the things that you aren't comfortable tackling, uh, you, can, you can get to your destination in a safe way. If there is a section uh, on your planned route that does make you feel scared and it is unavoidable, you can always get off uh, and walk your bike on the sidewalk. Um, and I also just want to sort of um, hit home that any road in this city that isn't a highway um, is you are allowed to, to cycle on it. Uh, you have a right to be there and a bicycle is a vehicle. Um, and just sort of knowing that um, and riding company, confidently and riding, uh, sort of taking up that space and riding um, like you are supposed to be there and that you have a right to be there um, is a great way to stay safe um, and sort of uh, be visible on the road. Um, one tip that if you are making a left turn that can be scary is that you uh, can do a two-stage left. So if you go straight through um, and into the far side of an intersection, you could sort of loop around or wait on the sidewalk and walk your bike until the lights turn in the direction that you want to go and you can like finish your false left. That's sort of a little tip that we like to give out there. But yeah, uh, so the next myth, uh, which looked to be, I think was the, was the one that most people were concerned about watching this. So that is, um, that's interesting and totally understandable is what about getting hot and sweaty? So of course, uh, this is possible, um, you are exercising. Um, as Dan said, it, it depends on what, to what degree you are um, pushing yourself. As he says, he, he cycles in the clothes that he wears at work. So he takes it slow, keeps it cool, um, and has like more of a laid back ride. Um, <clears throat> I do feel like when most people are asking this question, they're actually asking about odor and they're ask, actually worried, I'm going to be super smelly at work. Like how, how is this possible? Um, and just like a little aside about uh, human sweat, there are two different types of sweat that human bodies um, make. And one of them is stress sweat and one of them is made, of course, by exertion and um, overheating. So it's your body's natural way of cooling you down. Um, it makes, uh, it, it shows that you're alive and healthy and it's a good thing. Um, but I will say that uh, stress sweat is, is clinically proven and it's, it's known that it has a foul odor um, upon first um, sort of emission. Like it is, it doesn't smell good, um, but actual sweat from exertion and sort of like your body cooling itself down is actually mostly water. Um, it's 80% water and it is virtually odorless. So you only actually start smelling if bacteria um, is on your skin and you stay in sort of like your wet clothes and bacteria sort of like makes um, something that doesn't smell good on your skin. So as long as you take precautions to sort of like change your clothes or if you have sweat wicking uh, material to wear on your bike, uh, you can totally like avoid that fear. Um, so yes, you can also take it slow, sweat absorbent clothing. You can also get creative. If there is a shower at work, you're super lucky. Um, ask for resources and uh, bring a change of clothes and remember the power of like a little sink shower, a little cloth and a little water on your face and drink, drink ice water. Actually, it gets your basal body temperature down nice and fast. The other question that, uh, that it goes along with this is how to dress for the weather. And so Taylor kind of addressed the warm weather riding, but in wet weather, and I've got my rain cape on here, so. Um, you can wear a hood uh, like this or a rain jacket. Um, you can bring rain pants if it's really wet and you're worried about um, that kind of thing. And this right here is uh, a rain shoe covering. So again, in the wet weather, you can bring those along in case it, in case it rains. Um, in London, we get snow, we get winter. And so sometimes um, it's okay to stop riding in, in the snow. But if you if you plan on doing it often with cold weather, if the roads are clear, it's actually very easy to ride. It's just dressing for it is important. So layers is the key. Layer up as, as you need and plan for five minutes down the road. So don't plan to walk out the door and feel comfortable. You actually want to feel a little bit cold because as soon as you get biking and uh, you start exerting yourself, your blood rate or your heart rate gets up, you're going to warm up. So dress for five minutes down the road um, and pay attention to your hands your feet and your ears in the cold weather, um, and you'll be fine. So the other fear that people have, of course, a pra very practical one, very understandable is what if I get a flat tire? So this is worst case scenario. 
Um, if you plan for the worst, um, you're going to be fine. It happens less often than you think. Um, something simple like making a note of all of the bike shops or facilities uh, to help you um, if you do get a flat tire that are along your route so that you know where to head as soon as it happens. Uh, if you do need help, then that's, that's great. Um, keeping a bus pass on you or a bus ticket uh, is a great option as well because all of the LTC buses have bike racks on the front now, which is amazing. Um, a little side note about CAA, uh, because a bicycle is a vehicle, if you have CAA, you can call them and they can pick you up um, if that's something that brings you peace of mind um, and that's something that a service that you have. Uh, fixing a flat can be easily done and you can learn it yourself um, if you want. Um, it's not a skill that you need to ride your bike, um, but it's cool if you do know how or if you learn. Uh, there are also some precautions that can be taken uh, that avoid flats in the first place that can actually go farther than you think. Um, and that's simply like keeping an eye out for sharp objects and glass. And if you just sort of keep your head up, look where you're going, which you should be doing anyways. Uh, but if you pay special attention to the, to the um, debris on the road or avoiding areas where you can't quite see the bottom or what you're treading on, whether it's through a puddle or through a dusty area, it can save you more than you think. You can also uh, purchase puncture-proof tires. Um, that is a thing that you can get that uh, works pretty well. Yeah. The other thing that uh, is important or people are worried about is theft. And we saw that in the poll. Um, and I'm here with, uh, with a homemade solution to, uh, to show you how to lock up your bike here. Um, so the lock that I um, use is called a folding lock, but whether it's often a U-lock is, is, an, is another option. Um, and one tip that we have for you is to sort of buy the best lock you can buy because peace of mind is everything. Um, if you can feel comfortable about your bike, where it's locked up, that's important. If you can bring it indoors, even better. If you can keep it in a, a protected area, um, I know the hospitals and some places downtown have a, have a cage, a fence that only employees or certain people have access to. Those are huge advantages, but if you don't have that luxury, um, buying a good lock is important. And I just want to show that um, locking up the frame is, is, the, is the most important step, but um, locking the front wheel too. And so I'm just going to show you what it looks like here to so get my lock undone. So that's just sort of catching the, hopefully you can see that. That's catching the front. Oh, no. Catching the front wheel and the uh, and the bike frame um, all at once, and so that's an important thing if your wheels are easily removed uh, to do that. So just some tips: you don't have to, um, or theft doesn't have to be a deterrent to riding, but um, certainly buying a good uh, a good lock and and having that peace of mind is very important. So. Um... Hopefully, by now, we have convinced you that biking to work is a great idea and you should definitely give it a try. Um, so if you don't already have a bike, uh, you're going to need a bike. Um, you can borrow someone else's. You can buy a used bike or you can buy a new, a new bike uh, from your favorite local bike shop. Uh, you need to make sure that it fits and that it's comfortable. Um, you also, of course, have to make sure that it's safe. Uh, and in good working order, especially if it's a used bike. So there are some things that you need to look out for. Um, we put, uh, London Cycling put out a video recently uh, where Dan uh, sort of quickly goes through all the all the like key things uh, that are good to look out for if you are buying a used bike and you don't really know anything about bikes. So check that out um, if you haven't already. It's sort of been floating around lately uh, and it's really nice. Um, other than that, any bike will do, and if you are having a problem with your bike that you do already have, it's sort of being resurrected uh, from the past because you haven't ridden it in a while, uh, take it to any local bike shop in town or a sticky wheel, um, and we can help you get back uh, riding. And I think Dan is going to take us through a little demo route planning now. That's right. Um, so I just have to, uh, we're going to go to to Google Maps. That's the, the most common thing that people use to plan the route. Um, so just bear with me here while I I get to, to that on my computer. Okay, I think you can see that hopefully. And I've just picked a, one location. I mean, we can't plan everybody's route right now, unfortunately. Um, but we're going to start from Witchwood Park. So this is the northwest of the city. 
and we're going to head to Victoria Hospital. Um, so you can see in Google Maps the, the driving feature might be um, you might be more familiar with or not, or transit. Um, but if you click on bicycling for your option here, uh, you can see that it gives you a few different options. Um, and sorry, I just got to get the screen out of the way. So the first option, if you notice on the left, it's actually the longest option, um, and it takes even longer. So I'm going to choose this middle option here, um, partially because I know that route would be the better one. And we're going to show you why. So um, I'm just going to drag drag the screen. Hopefully you can follow along here. So um, we start in a residential neighborhood, and we hit Sarnia Road, which is an arterial road. So it's important to plan where you're going to cross busy roads like that. And so there's a light, a light here. And so that's an important one and that's a good place to cross and you're back into a neighborhood after that. Um, so this route looks pretty good so far. You enter a park um, is part of this route. And so again, depending on the time of day, that may be a, a good option um, or your own comfort level. If it's not, you can always drag it um, to, to choose another option for you. Um, one thing that's cool about Google Maps is if in the layer option here at the top left, if you choose um, cycling, you'll see that some green lines show up. And so if it's a, if it's a hard green line, that's a bike path um, or a bike lane. And if it's a dotted green line, usually that's a, a signed bike route. So it's not, there's no bike lanes per se, but it usually it's a route that um, at least has been acknowledged by the city as a route for bikes. Um, like Taylor said, every every road can be ridden. Um, it's not a highway. Um, so we'll zoom in here. We actually have a bike lane on Platts Lane here and Woodward. So those are all good options. And when we make a turn, again, there's a traffic light here. We get to Riverside. Again, there's bike lane. So this route's working out pretty well in terms of um, a nice, safe route so far. Uh, when we cross the river, um, it's going to take us along the Thames Valley Parkway, which is beautiful. Um, again, depending on time of day or your own comfort level, that may not be a good option for you. And so if you're feeling like, oh, there's a better, I want to stay on the roads, um, you can just simply drag the route up to, again, if you're using Google Maps as your tool. Um, one thing that I know from, from experience is this bridge here on Rideout is, um, doesn't feel the best because it's a narrow bridge. Um, it's only a short part of the journey if you, if you stay on the path. Uh, if you see that here, um, and so it's um, yeah, it's a, it's a short part, and sometimes you just have to go for it. It's not uh, there is a sidewalk there too, so you can walk it across the the bridge, and then you start. Um, I'll show you here. You get into a bike lane right after the oh dear, right after the bridge, um, and that can be helpful to. Okay, so the bridge is there. You can see it's a narrow bridge. Then as soon as you get off, there's a bike lane that starts right here. Um, and then you're going to follow this road here on Rideout. And again, this is just one example. But I want to show you some of the things that we like to think about um, for those of us who have experience. So with Google Maps and tells you to take baseline, this wouldn't be a, a terrible route by any means. Um, but I'm going to show you what baseline would look like after Wellington here. It's a pretty busy road. Um, and cars start to move quicker here when they have four lanes. So uh, I'll show you one just workaround here that we know is a good option. You see these dotted, this green dotted line is assigned a route on a neighborhood street. Um, if we just pull up the, the map here, it barely changes the time uh, that's going to take us or the distance. And it only involves uh, crossing Wellington at a pedestrian crossing. Um, so there's like some subtle things like that, just some tips and tricks that you learn along the way that can really uh, improve your commute. One thing I will say is um, use Google Maps, try it out. If you have no uh, no friends who bike or um, you know, you're just gonna go for it, that's okay, try it. And you might just learn along the way. You might realize that, okay, there's one, one route I tried, I didn't like it, I'm gonna try something else tonight. Um, that's okay. And uh, we just wanted to give you an idea of how to use a tool like Google Maps. The city also has a tool on their website called City Map. You just search City Map, all one word, on their website, you'll find it. Um, and they have 
uh, description of all the bike lanes and different colors for for different bike um, facilities. And so it gives you an idea of where the, the bike lanes are in the city. And our work at London Cycle Link is to um, make the whole city safe so you don't have to do all this sort of careful planning. You just get to go where you want to go. Um, but that might not happen overnight. So in the meantime, uh, we hope that this was helpful in giving some planning advice. And at the end of the presentation, we'll give you our contact. And you can always uh, feel free to ask us how to, how to plan a route or, or for any tips or tricks you might have. We'll go back to the presentation now. And I think Taylor is going to walk us through this. Thanks, Dan. Uh, yeah, that was a good uh, little route demo. Um, so just some extra tips and tricks, if we haven't mentioned any, any of these already, um, is in about sort of just like practically like riding. Um, of course, like any vehicle on the road, you want to be predictable and visible and you want to be communicating your intentions on the bicycle. Um, so, of course, that's using the hand signals that we've um, laid out in the infographic there. Um, if those are a little bit difficult for you to do at first on the bike, practicing them um, is a great way to get used to them. I remember taking my hand off uh, up off the handlebar for the first time and trying to sort of do it in a situation where I was going fast was sort of like oh, a little daunting so practicing it um, is a great way to get used to it and now it's just like second nature I'll do it without thinking now um, of course if you are riding in the dark or there's a chance that you might end up riding in the dark whether it's staying late at work um, always just take lights with you uh, to have that option uh, because it's always kind of a bummer when you get stuck somewhere and you don't have lights and you have to get your bike home um, another thing that you might not think about, but that's important, it's common sense, is if you are doing more physical activity and it is a big change to your normal, uh, drinking more water and um, eating food, uh, healthy foods that are going to support uh, the extra exertion that you're putting in um, is a great way to make sure that you um, don't get too tired um, and that you feel good when you're on the bike. Also, uh, just try test riding your route beforehand. Uh, if you are nervous about it, uh, sort of pack up for work like you normally would or take a friend like Dan suggested and do, do the route so that you do feel comfortable when you're doing it on a day when you are actually using it uh, to get to work. Um, so next we are going to talk about how employers can be supportive, uh, which is super important. So um, assuming we've convinced you that you're gonna try it, um, or maybe you are an employer listening to this right now and you could benefit from knowing how to support uh, your employees cycling. Um, talking about the benefits um, is an amazing way to sort of like get the ball rolling um, because of course uh, having your employees cycle to work and receive those benefits is a great thing for you, uh, for productivity and um, having your employees feeling good and refreshed and healthy. Um, a big thing uh, to talk about in a workplace is about space. And if you are a cyclist listening, you know that this is a big deal, whether this is having a space for your bike to be kept, having a space for your gear, having a space to hang up clothing that you cycle to work in is like just a huge plus uh, that of course, not all workplaces are gonna have that luxury, but it definitely is an encourager of this um, and a great thing to sort of like uh, talk about at work. Uh, so let your coworkers know uh, that you are doing this uh, so that they can support you and be encouraging. Um, you can also encourage them to start, uh, maybe talk about riding together or perhaps even creating a bike to work initiative in the workplace. It's a great thing. It's a great uh, and commendable environmental initiative in any workplace. Um, so yeah, only good things uh, from biking to work. Um, yeah, I think it is time to finish, which is crazy that flew by. Um, thank you for listening. We're going to take questions after this, so uh, we can still chat. Um, so that's all good. Uh, but if you do need inspiration, don't forget to connect with us on social media. I find that the best way to stay motivated um, is to have and feel a sense of sharing uh, with any activity that I'm doing. So I really do see cycling as like a lifestyle and it's so lovely to have a place uh, to share stories and thoughts or even just a story from the morning commute. Um, so feel free, uh, or even if you have questions and you'd like some advice, uh, feel free to post anything like that on uh, the London Cycle Link Facebook page. Uh, you can also peruse our website if you haven't already. We're on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter. Um, and please, please, please feel free to email us um, either Dan and I directly through info at londoncycling.ca. Um, if you have any concerns or just questions or you just want to talk about cycling to work, um, 
yeah, thank you for tuning in. Yeah, we hope you enjoyed this. And uh, if you have any questions, please ask them now so that we can uh, we can address them. And if um, if the other panelists, oh, we got one question here, I think. What's the best way to carry my clothes to work? So Taylor, do you want to address that? Sure. Yes. Um, there are many ways to carry things um, on a bike. Um, I find that when people are first starting out, uh, a lot of people are using backpacks. Uh, some people like this, and there are some really nice cycling backpacks out there that are comfortable with pads that you can keep using if that's your jam. Um, like uh, Dan, I think, mentioned in his uh, cycling to work stories um, that he sort of started out with a backpack and then uh, sort of like slowly converted to uh, panniers and racks. Uh, so eventually, um, if your bike allows, you can get racks fitted uh, to your bike and you can get all kinds of different bags and vessels to carry things in, whether it's a handlebar bag, whether it's panniers, uh, whether it's a saddle bag. Um, you don't even necessarily need racks. There are rackless options uh, for sort of like modern um, bike packing sort of like setups. Um, yeah, the, the options for, for carrying stuff on your bike are actually quite infinite. Um, and it's fun once you get into it and figure out what, what works for you. Yeah, I remember when I first started, I was carrying groceries on in plastic grocery bags on the side of the handlebars, unfortunately, and that was uh, uh, unfortunate, but um, I've you know evolved and so it was bags on the back and now it's one bag on one side of the back, um, but people have front racks, people have a milk carton on the back that you just toss your, your grocery bags or your backpack in. Um, so there's all kinds of ways to carry stuff. So hopefully that helped. Thanks for the question. Uh, another question for you, Taylor, is there a review, rear view mirror option for bikes? And are there, are there any other accessories you suggest? Yeah, you can get little mirrors uh, fitted on your handlebars. And I actually very recently uh, was biking on the bike path and uh, on the TVP and someone was riding in front of me. It was all like good, calm, normal speeds. And um, she was about to go past someone um, on the left, which is like she, she shoulder, well, normally she would shoulder check, but she actually looked in her little rear view mirror and just saw me there. Sort of hi, and she sort of like waited, waited, um, and it, yeah, it wasn't a close call or anything. It was like a very casual sort of just glance, and then she saw, and yeah, I think um, a lot of people who are used to driving as well and converting to cycling like sort of like uh, comforts like that, um, and it's totally a thing and totally affordable, and you can like totally find a mirror for your bike. Yeah, no problem. You can also get things that are attached to your helmet as well. I've seen people use for mirrors. And then, yeah, other accessories, I mean, the, the ones that jump to mind, I mean, a bell is actually mandatory by law, so that, that should, you, already sh you should already have that on your bike. Um, if you want to stay hydrated, if, especially if it's a long commute, a water bottle holder is important. Um, I like a kickstand on my bike. Um, not many, some people don't like that, but, it, you know, that can be a good option, too, depending on where you're, how you use it. Uh, are there any other accessories we're missing, Taylor? Uh, the only other thing I can think of is not an accessory, but you can just use your voice as well. If you sort of like panic and don't use your bell, you can just say bike back or on your left or on your right or bike, bicycle approaching. Um, and yeah, that's also just like a nice way to like tell people that you're there. And it's always better to like say that you're there or ring your bell than, than to not if you're unsure. That's great. Um, we have another question about have, have either of us used bike map app? I have not, I haven't heard of that one. Um, have you heard of that or what, what app do you use? Bike map, no. No, uh, the app I use is called Commute with a K, K-O-M-O-O-T, if anyone is interested, it's really good. Yeah, and there's other apps. I know um, Strava is one that fitness, a lot of people use for fitness or for tracking sort of how far you've gone, where you've gone. Um, and I think Map My Ride or, or there's something like that that people use as well. I can't remember what. Um, yeah, Matt, my ride is good. Ride with GPS as well, called Ride yeah. Ride with GPS. Yeah. So they all have the, the nice thing about all those apps is they're tailored to cycling, where they will not just show you roads, but they'll show you sort of bike paths and such that um, allows you to either plan your trip or show. Um, and actually, just to, to say that with a route planning, I should have said that is that some people use their phone as their navigation. Um, so you can get your uh, a spot on your handlebars to, to place your phone. You put Google Maps on, tell it, tell it where you're going, and it'll even tell you where to turn. Um, but just like a car, you can have that sort of functionality right on your bike. Um, so that's another option. 
And if there are no more questions, um, I want to uh, just introduce Luis. He's our um, our board chair and uh, of London Cycle Link. And I just want to make sure that uh, we haven't missed anything, or if he wants to say something now, um, I'd like to invite him in if he's if he's there. You there, Luis? Uh -huh. Yep, I'm here. Okay. Anything we missed or anything you want to? Uh, no, I, I th there's just one little comment I think I'd add added there is um, one very important um, accessory is light, right? So if you think about using your bike, if you're using it like daily and you're probably using it during the night, it's very important to have light. Uh, not sure this is mandatory, but it's definitely very important to have. Uh, and uh, as for mapping, uh, one of the things that I know that work really well, but it's not easy to have is to actually a human being who knows where he's going or she's going, uh, that can help you with that and can ride you with you. And I'm pretty sure that uh, if you don't have a friend, you can uh, join our community as a member, as a CQE member, and we will be more than happy to give you some tips around biking in London, well, we definitely will find someone that lives nearby where you live or where you're going to work that can give you some uh, very useful, useful advice, especially because the city, uh, from a cycling perspective, is different. Uh, it's a different city uh, from the bus rider and uh, from the driver. It, it's just different routes that you need to take. So um, there is some, um, it's really important to have that experience to share. Thank you so much, guys. It's a very uh, informative uh, webinar. Well, thanks everybody for watching and uh, for being here. Kelsey, I, I thought maybe you'd uh, be able to finish off. But before I give it to you, I just want to say that um, if anyone wants to stay connected with London Cycle Link, the easiest way is to go to our website, londoncyclelink.ca, sign up for our newsletter at the bottom, um, and that way you, you stay in touch with the events that are coming up. Uh, we share tips and tricks. And uh, and anything that we're we're working on. So um, if you want to stay connected, please do. And thanks, Kelsey, for having us uh, on this for for getting us to, or allowing us to share. Thank you, Kelsey. <laughs> no problem. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for putting this presentation together. Thank you so much to all the attendees who've uh, made the time today to listen in. And um, yeah, they kept encouraging you to be in touch. So it'd be awesome to hear about, you know, who starts biking to work as a result of this. Um, I was really excited because I used to bike to work, but I haven't in a while, mostly because I had to um, drive to places across the city throughout the workday. But since then my role sort of changed. So I, I definitely could, so no more excuses. Um, but yeah, I totally get the, um, just, you see the city in such a different way. You get so much exposure to nature, especially if you drive on the, the TVP and you get to see the beautiful parks the city has. So um, I know a lot of people complain about the lack of cycling infrastructure and I know there's still lots to do, but there's also, we also do have quite a bit to get, get you across the city. So yeah, I hope, I hope a lot of people start taking more action. Um, yeah, so thanks again, everyone. And um, yeah, if you ever have any questions, reach out to them. Otherwise, have a great day. Can I just uh, do one more invitation? Um, I think we're having our summer ride um, uh, event. And I think, especially if you're just starting to, to bike, if you're getting your bike for the first time, or just want to explore your neighborhood, I think the summer rides are a great way to do this. Uh, we're always uh, we're focusing on easy routes, short routes, and usually they have some nice prizes for, for the people who, who do the ride. And we definitely can have more tips and information about riding in London. So I would encourage everyone who's willing to get on, on the bike to try our summer ride. And you can uh, also find that information on our website. Great. Awesome. All right. Well, with that, thanks again, everybody, and have a good day. Stay fried.